So this morning we're going to be in Psalm 148. Psalm 148. And um, the title of the message this morning is All Creation Praises. All Creation Praises. And um, before we get into the study, let me go ahead and pray once more. And then we can look at this um, together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this beautiful time of worship. And we thank you just for another wonderful day to come here together, Lord, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, to seek your face, to glorify your name, Lord God, and to hear from you this morning. And we pray this morning as we hear from you through your word that you prepare our minds and our hearts to hear from you. Soften that soil in our hearts, Lord God, that your word would land on good soil, would take root in our lives, it would change us, Lord. And just help us, Lord, to leave this place with a heart of praise and a heart of worship this morning as we go through your word. We pray for those, once again, that are making their way here, that you would get them here safely. We pray for those that maybe are sick in body this morning, that you would heal them and you would encourage them, Lord God. And we just thank you so much for this beautiful time. And um, we're just so amazed by you, Lord God, and we love you and we're so grateful to be considered children of the Most High. We love you again, once again, Lord God, and we ask these things, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 148, once again, all creation praises. And as we all know, in this day of age of technology and social media, many of us are familiar with flash mobs. I'm sure many of you have seen a flash mob before. If you don't know what a flash mob is, that's okay. It's basically a group of people that assembles in a public place and they have a brief performance and then they quickly disassemble and disperse back into uh, the walls or wherever they came out of. And many times you can witness these flash mobs on social media or you can wit witness them in person. I've never seen one in person. I've seen them on social media. But a few months ago, there was a massive flash mob in a Florida mall. And it was documented on YouTube amongst everything else that's documented on YouTube. And in the midst of that flash mob, hundreds if not thousands of Floridians in that mall, they broke out in unison to Rich Mullins' Awesome God. And as you can imagine, that multi-level facility was filled with praise, it was filled with worship, fit for our King, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And though that flash mob of believers was very stunning, it was amazing to hear, it's only a shadow to what it will sound like when all of creation sings praises onto the Lord together in unison. And remember what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 14, verse 11. There he writes, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. And this morning, as we look at Psalm 148 together, hopefully it reminds us of what this praise and what this worship should look like as we sing it in unison with creation to our Lord and Savior. And I hope this morning that wherever your heart is right now, that when we leave this place, we leave this place with a heart that is filled with praise and a heart that is filled um, with worship. So just a little bit of a background here regarding Psalm 148. One scholar put it this way, I have seen and heard many different choirs, but never one like this. It is made up of all creation, inanimate and intimate. The universe is the choir loft, endless rows of chairs, tier upon tier. And if you can imagine that, think of like the grandest auditorium or concert hall, and it's just filled with beautiful praise and beautiful worship resonating from the walls and all over the place. It's out of this world if you think about all of creation doing that at the same time. And in studying this psalm um, over the past several days, it reminded me of what John documents for us in the book of Revelation. If you look there in chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, it says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless, thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne 
and to the Lamb forever and ever. And when you consider these last five psalms in the book of Psalms, including 146, 147, 148, which is our focus this morning, 149 and 150, these are what we call the Hallelujah Psalms. And the focus in these psalms is praising um, the Lord. And this morning in Psalm 148, we are reminded that when we praise the Lord, we actually join creation in that praising. And I think that's pretty awesome when you think about it. In this psalm, we're going to see that the, the phrase or the word praise is used 13 times. And what we'll see is that the psalmist is going to begin in the third heaven, in the heavenly realm. He's going to work his way down to the second heaven, or outer space, into the first heaven or the atmosphere surrounding the planet. He's going to make his way onto the planet through the animals, through the vegetation, through the topography, and then finally to mankind and how all of us should be a part of resonating praise and worship to the Lord. If any psalm can reveal the glory and the awesomeness of praise onto the Lord, it's this particular psalm. And as we read it this morning, um, you'll see what I'm talking about. And I don't know what weight you're carrying on your shoulders this morning, what worries or anxieties you brought in here with you this morning. Understand that even though circumstances change, the author of Hebrews reminds us that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because of that truth, we can still praise the Lord regardless of what's going on in our lives. So before we actually look at the word together, let me read the whole psalm to you. It's not very long. It's only 14 verses. So Psalm 148, the psalmist writes, Hallelujah, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly armies. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in position forever and ever. He gave an order that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, all sea monsters and ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and cloud, stormy wind that executes his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creatures that crawl and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, young men as well as young women, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty covers heaven and earth. He has raised up a horn for his people, resulting in praise to all his faithful ones, to the Israelites, the people close to him. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, so this beautiful journey of praise and worship is going to begin firstly in the heavens. So in those first six verses, we're going to see that the heavens praise the Lord. So notice in verse one, he says, Hallelujah, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. Now, when you think of the heavens, the word of God tells us that there is an existence of three heavens. And this is actually something I shared a while back when I taught through Psalm 19. And that term third heaven is presented, for example, by the Apostle Paul. If you look in that second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. And if you remember there, Paul was speaking about his sufficiency in the Lord, and he was boasting about that sufficiency. But there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, he writes, Boasting is necessary... It is not profitable, but I will move on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a human being is not allowed to speak. I will boast about this person, but not about myself, except 
of my weaknesses. Now, in that particular portion of scripture, some scholars suggest that perhaps this was Paul speaking of himself, and perhaps he had some sort of out-of-body, near-death experience, and they link it to that time when he was stoned in Lystra, if you remember there in that 14th chapter of Acts, when him and Barnabas that had healed that lame man, and everyone was saying that they were gods, and they were bringing sacrifices onto them. Regardless of who this person is in this particular description, this place being called the third heaven here can be thought of as the heaven of heavens. That is, where the Lord is right now, seated at the right hand of our, of our Father, our final destination as believers. Therefore, the second heaven, which we will talk about in the middle section of this particular psalm, refers to outer space, where the planets live, where the stars live, where the galaxies are, all of those cool things. And then, of course, the first heaven refers to Earth's atmosphere, right? That thin fluid surrounding the entire planet, protecting us from the short ray radiation from the sun and from the ultraviolet radiation from space. And what we see here is that the place where God rules together with outer space and Earth's atmosphere, they're all joined together in praising and worshiping the Lord. And when you think about that, that is quite a marvelous sight when you think about that and you hear it in your mind and in your hearts. Now, Lonis in verse 2, he speaks of the praise in the third heaven. He says, praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly armies. And this is a beautiful verse because when you think about worship in heaven, the word of God only sparingly gives us descriptions or very few descriptions of what that actually looks like. And you can actually read some of those if you look in Isaiah chapter 6, if you look in the book of Daniel chapter uh, 7, as well as in the book of Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, for example. But if you notice here that all the angelic beings are called to praise the Lord. And in fact, John documents this if you look in the book of Revelation chapter 4 verse 8. He documents an instance of this. There, if you remember, he's describing the throne room of heaven. And he says there are four living creatures covered with eyes in the front and in the back, if you could imagine that, were around the throne on each side. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped singing, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and, to is, and who is to come. In the book of Revelation, John further documents in chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. There he says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless, thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And once again, if you can imagine this, what a beautiful and what an amazing side of worship that is that we hear and read about when we think about this in the heavenly realm, in the third heaven. Now in verse 3, he begins to move and make his way into the second heaven. He says, praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. And notice here that now he's referring to these heavenly bodies located in that second heaven. And they too, just like everyone in the heavenly realm, are to praise God. Now, if you look back to the book of Genesis, in that first chapter, verses 14 through 17, there Moses, he documents for us the reasoning behind why the Lord created these heavenly hosts in the second heaven. It says there, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky, to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. They will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth 
and it was so. God made the two greater lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night, as well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, to rule the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the fourth day. So once again there, reflecting back on that fourth day of creation as Moses documents for us, the whole reason behind the creation of these heavenly hosts in the second heaven. And all of this brings God glory. It brings him praise. It brings him worship. And you think about it. You think about space. I don't know if you guys think about space often or not. But when you look up at the stars, when you look up at the sky, you know, what comes into your mind, right? You think about the planets, like the gas giants, like Jupiter and like Saturn, for example, and just how majestic they are. And the fact that God created all those things for a reason. And it's to glorify his name and to bring him praise. And because of creation and the placement of all these heavenly hosts in the second heaven, we know through astronomy, but first through the Bible, that all of these things create our seasons here on the planet. You think about the earth and how it rotates in this elliptical shape around the sun. And it's tilt, it's so perfect that we're able to experience these phases and all these different seasons. And you think about the moon, right, and all of its phases and, and how it controls the tides. It helps to control the tides. You know, that there's also the Earth's rotation. But also you think about the spectacular eclipses, for example, whether it's a lunar or a solar eclipse. And in fact, a few months ago, I think it was in the middle of October, we did have that solar eclipse that um, impacted the far west part of Texas. If you remember, we had that 65 to 80% coverage of solar radiation from the moon. And we were able to see that. It was quite spectacular. I'm sure many of you experienced that. But it got a little bit dark outside. And all of that, it glorifies God's name. It brings praises to the Lord. And in fact, if you missed that one, in April of this year, the 8th, I believe it is, we're going to have another solar eclipse. However, you'll have to go a little bit further east to actually experience that one. But once again, all those signs, all those things in that second heaven are there for a reason. It's to glorify God and to bring him praise. Now, what's interesting is that in this portion of the, of the word of God here in Psalm 148, this is the only place where it specifically says that the sun, the moon, and the stars should praise God the Lord. And that's pretty cool. And when you think about this, you know, right now we can't see the angels in heaven worshiping and praising the Lord. However, we can see the day sky. We can see the night sky. And it speaks to us, right? They reveal the knowledge. They reveal the glory, the wisdom, and the creativeness of the Lord who created them. Now, the sky doesn't speak to us like with words. I mean, if the sky is speaking to you with words, there's a question there to ask yourself. Um, however, the Lord speaks to us through his creation in terms of what he reveals to us. Psalm 19.1 tells us, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. And certainly the glory of God is visible for all to see, regardless of where you live, regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of the color of your skin. None of those things matter because the sky engulfs the entire planet and we all experience it. We all witness it. In fact, if you look in the, in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20 tells us, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And I love that because we have no excuse. He's around us. He surrounds us. And he engulfs us. He engulfs his place. Now, when you think about the sun, right, how it rises, how it sets. And, you know, here in El Paso, it, it's, it's pretty unique because we have this huge piece of granite cutting the city in half, the Franklin Mountains, kind of the tail end of the, the Rocky Mountain uh, chain here in the, the southern part of the United States. But that impacts our sunrises, it impacts our sunsets. So it really depends on one side of the Franklin Mountains you live on, but it's just as spectacular to see those sunrises and those sunsets. And then you think of the moon and its beautiful, fa its beautiful phases and um, all the stars, right? The endless stars in, in the sky. And the Lord knows them by name. Psalm 70, 147 tells us this. You think of all the constellations. 
And I don't know if you've done this before, but going out of the city, away from all of the light pollution and you know, all the traffic, of course, you, you look up to the sky and you see the stars. Like, what comes into your mind when you see the stars, when you see the sky? And hopefully it's, you know, the Lord and the fact that he created those things and you can glorify his name. And I remember when I was little, I think I was like in second or third grade, my dad bought me a telescope. And I remember we would spend hours looking at the moon and looking at the stars and, you know, seeing the craters on the moons and looking for the different constellations in the sky. And when you think about the stars, like people look at the stars and they're like, ah, they're all the same, right? They're just these dots of light. But the truth of the matter is they're all different. They're all unique in how the Lord made them. 1 Corinthians 15, 41 tells us there's a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, and another of the stars. In fact, one star differs from another star in splendor. And that's, that is really cool to me to know that these stars, every single one of them, there's like so many of them. We can't even count them. We can estimate but they're all so different because God created them, just like us as his children. We're all so different. We're all so unique. And it's all for his glory and for his purpose. And I remember in those moments of stargazing with my dad, we were in awe of creation. And it all brought him, the Lord, the praise and the worship that, was, you know, that he deserved, that we gave him. Now, in verse 4, notice here, he continues with the heavens. He says, praise him highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. So here, this kind of takes us back once again to the book of Genesis. If you look in that first chapter, verses 6 through 8, if you remember there on that second day of creation, it says, Then God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse sky, evening came, and then morning the second day. So, of course, here, this is referring to that second day of creation when the Lord separated the waters so that the sky appeared above the seas or the atmosphere. And we'll talk more about the atmosphere in um, in the next section in just a little bit. But essentially what this verse is saying in its entirety is that the ultimate of heavens, the third heaven, the heaven of heavens, along with outer space, the second heaven, along with the first heaven or earth's atmosphere, they all come together and they praise God together. And that's a beautiful thing. Now in verses five, four, I'm sorry, five and six, there we see why the heavens are called to praise the Lord. It says, let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded, and they were created. He set them in position forever and ever. He gave an order that will never pass away. So why should the hosts in heaven praise the Lord? Well, simply because he made them. And he gave him the privilege of serving him and serving his people as well. And all of that brings glory to his name. And not only were they made by the Lord, but they also continue because of his word. And it gives all of creation reason um, to praise the Lord. So once again, here what we've seen so far is the fact that the heavens bring glory and praise on to the Lord. And as we move on here, the psalmist is now going to take us to the melody of praise that is coming from the earth. So in verses 7 through 13, we're going to talk a little, bit about, a little bit about the earth and how the earth praises the Lord. So in verse 7, the psalmist writes, Praise the Lord from the earth, all sea creatures and ocean depths. And just like heaven, the ocean and everything that lives in it is also called to join in in the praise and the worship of the Lord. And as as we read just a second ago, the psalmist begins with all of the sea creatures and the ocean itself. If you look back to the day of creation, that fifth day of creation in Genesis, In chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, it says, So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water, according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind. There he's speaking of the birds. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the water of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came and then morning, and of course this was the fifth day of creation. And when you think about the ocean and the depths of the ocean, 
the abyss of the ocean. You know, sometimes it's a little bit scary. But when you think about it and how unique it is, you think about all the creatures that live in the ocean and still the ones that are yet to be discovered because there's so many things we don't even know or have seen yet. It's amazing, right? You think about the hammerhead sharks, the beluga whales, you think of like the sea turtles, the coral reefs, all of these amazing things that are in existence in the oceans and in the seas. And in their magnificence, they glorify God. It's so cool. And then when you think about the ocean itself, and I was thinking about this several years ago when I was in graduate school, I got to spend time in La Jolla. I was there for about six weeks. And I was doing some research there when I was in graduate, graduate school at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And I remember like the ocean was there. It was, it was hard to work because the ocean was distracting. And you think about the ocean and the endless waves and the currents and the circulations and, and all these things that come with the ocean that God has created, God has ordained, that oceanographers you know, refer to as you know, the, the thermal hailing or some sort of circulation that, that defines the ocean. All of that God has ordained, all of that God has created. And you think about that and how the pH of the ocean and like the temperature of the ocean is so perfect that it's able to sustain all of this delicate sea life. All of that gives glory to God because a little shift in that can certainly shift the, the, um, the ocean circulations and also the life that lives in the ocean. And it's amazing that God holds all of that in his hands because he created it and we can glorify him for that. And when you think about the ocean, the roar of the ocean, you guys have heard the ocean before, the sounds of the crashing waves, all the different wave types that the ocean brings, and the sounds of all the creatures in the ocean, they combine and they bring like this ensemble of worship onto the Lord because he created them and he holds them in his hands. And in fact, if you look at Psalm 89 verse 9, there it says, you, speaking of the Lord, rule the raging sea. When its waves surge, you still them. And certainly the waves, they still know his name because he can calm the storm in the sea. Now in verse 8, now the psalmist turns his attention to earth's atmosphere. And this is my favorite section. So here he says, or he writes, um, lightning and hail, snowing cloud, stormy wind that executes his command. So they too are ordered or ordained to Praise the Lord. And I can tell you as a, as a trained atmospheric scientist, I studied the atmosphere for many, many years, these verses are very beautiful to me. And when you think about the atmosphere, right, that thin fluid surrounding the entire planet, it's all, you know, everyone can see it. Everyone experiences it. It reminds us of his handiwork. And if you look in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, there it tells us regarding the atmosphere. It says, The wind goes towards the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. And here in this, this portion of Scripture in Ecclesiastes, what is being spoken of here is the general circulation of the atmosphere. So in the post-flood atmosphere that we live in, the air typically rises at the equator. It goes towards the poles of the planet. It sinks. And all the latitudes in between, as the earth is spinning and you have all this topography in between, it creates different weather patterns and different wind directions, all ordained by God, all controlled by the Lord himself. And not only does this impact the weather patterns and the climate, but also it impacts the hydrologic or the water cycle which we just read about here in Ecclesiastes. And all of that also controls the seas and the oceans. The wind, it creates the trade winds, it creates all these pressure, um, pressure various, various surface of pressure on the planet, and it drives the weather, it drives the climate. And you think about this, and all of this creates the clouds we see, it creates the precipitation types that we experience, the lightning and the thunder. And in fact, if you look in Psalm 29, David uses some beautiful symbolism there to represent the voice of God with thunder and even the wind. And of course, we know what wind is, especially if you live in northeast El Paso. We know what wind is, right? And they all sing praises to the Lord. So next time the wind is blowing and a trash can is blowing down the street, remember that that all glorifies God, believe it or not. Now, a few weeks ago, we experienced some significant or some unusual 
atmospheric dynamics or phenomena here in the Chihuahuan Desert or Far West Texas. If you remember, um, I think it was, maybe it was a month ago, there was uh, some lens-shaped clouds in the sky. And um, they look like, you know, some people said unidentified flying objects, but um, those were lenticular clouds, very rare for this part of the country. And I remember it was a Sunday, we were leaving church and I saw the cloud formation to the north and I was so excited. It was like a kid in the county thermals crash getting out of the parking lot. I was so excited. I even called Pastor Angel, he can attest to it, and told him to look at the cloud. But at the same time, I was in awe of the Lord because that was his handiwork. He created that cloud. And the fact that those clouds bring him glory, praise, and worship, it's a pretty awesome thing. Everyone could see that cloud. Everyone was talking about that cloud. And the fact that the Lord made it, hopefully that sunk in in their hearts as well. And certainly the heavens declare the glory of God as we've read in Psalm chapter 19. And in terms of the atmosphere, that portion of creation is, is very dear to me. And for me personally, on the scientific journey that I was on early on in life, studying geophysics, studying atmospheric sciences, desiring to change the world for the better with science, but not without God, I found him on that journey. And he took a hold of me. And I can tell you the first sip of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist. But God is always waiting for you at the bottom of the glass. And he was waiting for me. I went from worshiping the creation, that is the atmosphere, to worshiping the creator of the atmosphere, which is the Lord. And he did that for me. Because once you taste and you see the goodness of the Lord, there is absolutely no turning back. And now when I look at the sky, when I look at the clouds, when I look into the atmosphere, it's not about the physics and the mathematics and the, the prediction of the atmosphere so much anymore, but it's more about God and everything that he's done for me. And because of that, I love him so much because what he did for me, he can do for anybody. Romans 1.20, and I, I read, read this a little bit earlier, a very dear verse to me, it says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And I love that because that verse defines what I went through. And I know for many, many other scientists and those that are pursuing those, those fields, I know that they're going to find God because he's in the creation, because he created it. And God is so good. Now, as we talked about the atmosphere, we talked about the oceans, and we talked about the sea life. Now he's going to move his way. The psalmist is going to move into the, um, the land itself. So if you look in verse 9, so let me read a little bit of, let me read verse, verse 7 first so it makes sense. So verse 7 says, praise the Lord from the earth. And then in verse 9 it says, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. So notice here, the praise begins in the topography of the planet, right? He starts talking about the mountains and the hills, and then he works his way into the flora or the plant life on the land. And this reminds me very much of what we read in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 11 through 12. And if you remember there, um, in this portion of scripture, we have an invitation for all to come to the Lord. And there the Lord writes through Isaiah, it says, So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, and certainly won't, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. You will indeed go out with joy and be peacefully guided. The mountains and the hills will break into singing before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. And certainly when we turn to God and we turn to his will, there is such great joy, even so that even the mountains and the trees and the plants, they join in in the praise and the worship with us. And when you think about the mountains and you think about the hills and just like all the topography that is out there on the planet, they're all made up of rocks, right? Rocks make up these, these land formations. And believe it or not, those rocks have a voice. And you're thinking to yourself, what the heck are you talking about? That's crazy. Well, in studying this, this portion of scripture, it reminded me so much of, remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem a few days before his crucifixion? They're on that Palm Sunday, and we'll be celebrating that in a few weeks here. If you look in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 9 through 11, there he documents for us, then the crowds who went ahead of him as Jesus was making his way into Jerusalem, and those who followed shouted, shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes 
in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And then if you look in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 19, verses 39 through 40, the Pharisees were angry. And some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, speaking of Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples, right? Like, tell them to be quiet. And then he answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. And I love this. We see God's creation always pointing to his power, to his authority, bringing him praise and bringing him glory. And you're thinking to yourself, rocks crying out? Like, how, how do you even imagine that? That's crazy. Well, several years ago, when I was an undergraduate, I was studying geophysics. So my life was oil, rocks, and you know, um, plate tectonics. My head was in the ground. I was like an ostrich, basically. I had my head in the ground. Before I had my head in the clouds, I was an atmospheric scientist. But I remember doing field studies, doing field work. And I hit a lot of rocks with a lot of different rock hammers. And I can tell you, when you hit a rock, it resonates. It gives off a sound. And all of the rocks are unique. So regardless of what you hit, you could kind of deduce or conclude what type of rock it was. And all the sounds were different, whether it was an igneous rock, like a granite, or a sedimentary rock, like a sandstone, or like a metamorphic rock, like a marble. They all sound different. They all have different resonance. They kind of like each had a voice, if you think about it. And when I read this, it reminds me of that. And I hear those rocks in my head. I'm like, wow, these rocks are worshiping the Lord. How many of you guys have heard a rock slide before? Those things are crazy. Yeah. And when you hear a rock slide, rocks sliding down a hillside, it is amazingly loud. And you hear these rocks. And when you hear rocks like that, you can imagine these verses, worshiping and praising the Lord. Whether the rock is by itself or whether it's part of a unit, like a mountain range or a hillside or some sort of topographic feature on the planet. These rocks, they speak to the Lord and they worship the Lord and they praise the Lord. Creation will always point to the, to the creator, to his power, to his authority. And that's so cool. I love that. Now, furthermore, as, you, as we look into the latter part of verse 9, the psalmist now talks about worship coming from the flora or the trees and the plants. And if you look back to the book of Genesis in chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, here, this is where the Lord created all of these plants. It says, Let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so, the earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God, God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then the morning, the third day. So that was the third day of creation. And when you think about the variety of plants and flowers on the planet, I mean, you just go to Lowe's, right? There's a whole bunch of plants and flowers there. They're not native. They drink a lot of water, so they probably shouldn't buy them. But you see all these plants. You see all these flowers. And I know we have some avid gardeners in here, like Julio in the back there, right? We have all these plants, all these trees, and there's just so many of them. You think of, for example, like the deciduous trees, like all the trees that lose their leaves, like all the trees that are bare right now. And you're like, man, those things are ugly. But just wait till they get their leaves. They're beautiful and they worship the Lord. The evergreens, right? All those that we have in our yards that are green all year, or maybe they're brown. I don't know. You have to water them in the wintertime. Remember that. All these things in their majesty, they glorify and they bring glory to the Lord. And even here in the Chihuahuan Desert of far west Texas, believe it or not, we have trees, we have cacti, and we have shrubs in the desert. And you're like, there's trees out there? There are trees out there, but they're small. And when you think about it, we've all seen this before in all of their glory, particularly during the monsoon season, right? Late June into early September when it rains here. Um, all of those things bloom, right? You think of like the ocotillo cacti. When it blooms, you think of the, the barrel cacti, the prickly pear, and the creosote bushes. All of us in this room are familiar with the creosote bushes because when it rains, that's what you smell. That so-called desert rain smell, it's the creosote bush. And those things can go up to two years without water, all because of the way God crafted them and created them, bringing all the praise and all the glory to him. So all those adaptations, the way they produce, or, um, yeah, produce photosynthesis, all of those things are unique because God created them that way. And that way they can worship and praise the Lord and we can worship and praise the Lord as well because of what he's done through creation. Now, in verse 10, he's going to move his way to the animal life. 
And here it says, wild animals and all cattle, creatures that crawl, and flying birds. So going back to Genesis, once again, if you look in that first chapter, verses 20 to 23, there, and we read it a while ago, that was the fifth day of creation. God created the birds along with the sea creatures. But then on day six, if you look in verses 24 through 25, it says, then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. So just like the flora, the plant life, when you think about the variety of fauna or the animal life that we have on this planet, it is totally incredible. And it brings praise and it brings worship to the Lord. I want you to think about that for a little bit. Think about the animals. I don't know if you've ever been on a, like in an African safari. I haven't. That's something I want to do. Um, but you think about all the animals, like the giraffes and like the rhinos and like the birds. You can go on and on and on. All these animals on the planet and their behaviors and the way they migrate, the way they eat. All of these things are carefully crafted um, by the Lord. And it, we can praise him and we can worship him for that. And I am an avid hummingbird watcher. Um, you know, some people frown upon that, but I like hummingbirds. I don't know. And every year I put out hummingbird feeders. And those little birds are incredible. You know, they migrate from the Canadian Rockies. They work their way south. And they tend to, like, kind of congregate here in the northern deserts of, of Mexico and in far west Texas. And those things can flap their wings 80 times, 80 times, 80 per second. And that's all because of how God created those little birds. And that's why they're const constantly um, eating um, or, you know, sucking in sugar water. Uh, because that's their electrolytes, or source of energy. They also eat bugs and stuff, but those feeders are very important. But once again, all of that glorifies God, and we can praise Him, and we can worship Him. And when you hear those birds, the flapping of the wings, it's almost as if they're worshiping the Lord as well. And they are, because He created them. And you think about the Chihuahuan Desert, once again, where we live. You think about the lizards and um, the mountain lions and, and even the deer. And Believe it or not, there's deer here. You go up the hill here to this little community of Mountain Park, up Titanic where Magnetic is, and there are deer up there, all glorifying God because he created them. And together in unison with the heavens, we've seen so far that on the earth, the topography, the animals, the oceans, the sea creatures, all of these things are worshiping him and praising him. And the only thing that is left is mankind. And this is what the psalmist is going to talk about in the next several verses. So the people of the earth praise the Lord. If you look here in verses 11 through 14, um, let me read 11 through 13 first. It says, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, young men as well as young women, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty covers heaven and earth. Now, remember, if you look back once again to Genesis, there Moses, if you remember, he documents for us regarding the creation of mankind. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, it says there, then God said, let us, and there he's referring to the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They were in existence from the beginning. He says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And by the way, those are the only two pronouns I see listed here in the word of God. Now God's praise should be proclaimed by all who are made in his image. And that's what... He, the psalmist is calling us to do here. And this includes the kings and the princes, as the word of God says here, the government officials, all the common people, the boys and the girls, the young and the old, all with their heads and their hands lifted high, praising the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And no one else in the universe deserves this praise but him, the Lord. And one day, mankind will do this very thing. Philippians 2, 10 through 11 tells us, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow 
in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And in the midst of this praise and worship of mankind, we should find ourselves as well, praising and worshiping the Lord. And you might be asking yourself, what does this actually look like? Well, you know, I believe it's, yes, praising the Lord with our mouths and all of our mind, all of our soul. But at the same time, we can also praise the Lord in how our hearts are full of the Lord. In other words, what's reflected of our hearts. So how we serve the Lord, how we serve others, our motives, and the place of where our hearts are. All of that brings praise to the Lord and how we love as well. And really, all of that boils down to how much time we are in fellowship with the Lord. And, you know, this, the person you spend the most time with, you're going to be more like that person. And you want to spend more time with Jesus Christ. And the only way you can do that is being in fellowship with him through his word, through prayer, being filled and led by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, being in fellowship with the church. All those things allow us to be more like him. And he is the ultimate example of praise and worship to God the Father. And just like Jesus, we want to surrender to God the Father daily. And the question becomes, you know, are we in the word? Are we in prayer? Are we in fellowship with him, with the church? Are we being led by the Holy Spirit? All these things combine, in addition to our actual worship and praise from our mouths, to bring him that praise and bring him that worship. I believe all of those things combined are very important. And sometimes the circumstances of life can contaminate our praise and our worship of the Lord. And we have to be very, very careful. We cannot allow that to happen. Remember that we can praise the Lord in any storm. I'm, I'm sure you guys have praised him in many, many storms in your life. Don't let anything or anybody get in the way of your praise and your worship of the Lord because we serve a jealous God. And we have to be very careful of this. It's an important thing. It's the most important thing in our lives. Now, if you look in this very last verse, verse 14, it says, He has raised up a horn for his people, resulting in praise to all his faithful ones, to the Israelites, to the people close to him. Hallelujah. So notice here that the children of Israel stand in a special place of nearness to the Lord. And it's through this restoration of this nation. And if you remember, when the Lord had brought them out of um, Babylonian captivity, he raised up a horn for them. And it wasn't necessarily an earthly king. If you remember, David's dynasty had ended at the capture of Zedekiah. And that left the remaining remnant that returned without an earthly king, if you remember. But they did have a nation, right? They had a priesthood. They had preserved that sacred word of God that had been delivered to them through their prophets. But ultimately, they would have Jesus Christ, the only person qualified to sit on David's throne. And as a result of this, blessings can flow to all the world and to all, everyone in the world can join in this grand praise and worship of the Lord because of this. And certainly in Christ Jesus, there's a lot of praise and worship um, that can be brought because there's so many reasons for that. So in closing this morning, there was a lot here, a lot of praising and worshiping. We began in the heavens. We worked our way to, um, to the earth. But in closing this morning, remember that we do not praise a God who is manufactured on earth. We praise the one true and living God who reigns from the highest heavens, the God who created all things. And through this psalm, the psalmist took us on this beautiful tour of praise and worship, right? It started up in the third heaven or the heavenly realm, and then it ended with mankind. And the journey was very symbolic of like a symphony orchestra. And when you think about a symphony orchestra, right, you have the winds, you have the strings, you have the percussion, sometimes you have a choir in there. And the melody is typically passed from section to section. But in, in this particular case, we have this psalm and the melody of praise and worship was passed around through all elements of creation, but yet all of it was singing in unison and worshiping and praising in unison. So we read that the heavens praise the Lord. That includes the third heaven or the heavenly realm where the angels and the angelic beings were called to praise and worship the Lord. We talked about the second heaven, the planets and the stars and the galaxies and all of their splendor and their beauty. They praise the Lord. And then we talked about the first heaven, right? That 
that thin fluid surrounding the planet, the atmosphere, and all of its majesty also praises the Lord. And then we talked about the earth praising the Lord, right? We talked about the, to the topography, the mountains and the hills. We talked about the sea creatures. We talked about the ocean, the flora, the plant life, the fauna, the animal life. All these things, they praise the Lord. And then lastly, we read that mankind is also called to praise the Lord and join all of creation. And God's praise should be proclaimed by all who are made in his image. And that includes all of us in this room, the children of Israel and everyone on the planet as well. And sometimes, like I said before, we can allow, allow circumstances in our lives to get in the way of our worship and our praise of the Lord. And that's something we have to fight daily. Because when we praise the Lord, we join all of creation in that praise. And that's so awesome when you think about it. It's amazing. I mean, how cool is that? And this morning, please understand that God, who created the heavens and the earth, he knows you by name because he created you. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, he wants to be your Lord and Savior. And he's not going to force his way into your heart. You're going to have to open the door of your heart for him to get in there. And that's something that you have to choose. But once you open that door and you allow him into your life, once you taste and you see the goodness of the Lord, there's no turning back. And when you join in with the Lord, you're joining in with creation and praising him as well. Your life turns into a life of praise. Your life turns into a life of worship. And I heard it once said that worship is simply giving God his breath back. And I love that. It's a beautiful way to think about it. And as we praise the Lord today and forever, let me close with Psalm 150. It's very short. Here in Psalm 150, and this is kind of like the grand finale of all the Psalms. It says, Hallelujah, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his ab abundant greatness. Praise him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise him with a harp and lyre. Praise him with a tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And let us always praise the Lord, church. Amen. Amen. So this morning, if you're joining us in person or maybe you're watching on the live stream and you were blessed by this message and you feel a tug at your heart and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, we want to give you that opportunity. And... The Lord's not going to force his way into your, into your life or into your heart, like, we, like I just said. That's something that you have to choose. And if you want a Lord and Savior that will never leave you nor forsake you, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. We want you to join in with all of creation to praise him and to worship him. And if that's you this morning, if you could just close your eyes and bow your head and just repeat this prayer with me this morning. My Heavenly Father, Lord God, I want to invite you into my life this morning and declare you as my Lord and Savior. And Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I recognize that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and change my life and use me for your glory. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. And as the Gospel of Luke tells us in chapter 15, when even one sinner repents, there is celebration in heaven um, by the angels. And, and right now, if you, if you turn to the Lord, they're celebrating in heaven on your behalf. And we're celebrating as well in our hearts with you. If you want more information, maybe about your next steps, maybe you need a Bible, maybe you need prayer, maybe you need a Bible teaching church where you can get connected, please reach out to us or you can come visit us. We have service on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. here at the intersection of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. And um, if you need anything, please get in contact with the church. We're here. Uh, we love you. We're praying for you. And we hope to see you again soon. So bye for now. God bless you.